Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. Welcome Spartans to another Halo Book Club episode, part of Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. I am your host Aaron and with me today we've got Krista. Hey! And we've got David. Hey everybody! And this book club we are covering the newest Halo novel, Halo Divine Wind. Yay! Which is not about farts at all. Unfortunately no one farts in this. I was like really excited, I'm like finally we're gonna get to the nitty gritty of the Halo universe, but no. They do the talk about and describe the smells of living two years with a bunch of Jirahane and Kigarado. That's too that's true, they do talk about that a lot. Maybe that's the divine wind, is like them finally washing themselves after two years with the uh... On this Uber Pelican, that sounds really cool. Yeah, the Uber Pel I hope they rated her five stars. <laughs> Brutes do, I imagine, they fart a lot. Like, they seem like they're... They're gaseous. Lots of gas, yeah. It seems like there's a lot of... There's, a, there's actual communication with smell there. I think they communicate emotion through smell, yeah. I, I think it would be a bit of a pretty rough time. We are going to dive into the book club. David, do you want to take us through some of our deets for this book? So the book, obviously, is Halo, The Divine Wind. Uh, we'll talk about the name a little bit later, because that's the only piece of trivia that was kind of put together uh, by the Wik- Halo PD guys. It's pretty interesting. Uh, kind of obvious at the same time, but whatever. We'll go with it. Author was Troy Denning. That's right, the daddy of Halo lore right now uh, out there pumping out some books for us. The publisher is Gallery Books. The formats are pretty much all their paper. It's not hardback, but it's paper, uh, audio, and also electronic. The release date was October 19th, 2021, just gone, this is the one hot off the presses. It is 464 pages long, which is about an average for a Halo book, it's pretty normal sized. Uh, I mentioned here the cover artist is Benjamin Carey, because the cover art is pretty dope. I do like that they've released like the Halo books cover arts before and that immediately sets so much uh, of your mind going crazy over who was that. So like the prelate essentially was announced by the cover artist which is pretty cool so I, I kind of like that and the quick summary of the back of the book so October 2559 which dates this game as post Halo 5 with the galaxy in the suffering grip of a renegade artificial intelligence another perilous threat has quietly emerged in the shadows the keepers of the one freedom a fanatical and merciless covenant splinter group has made its way beyond the borders of the galaxy to an ancient forerunner installation known as the Ark. Led by an infamous brute named Castor, the Keepers intend to achieve what the Covenant and all its might fail to do, activate Halo and take the last steps on the path of the great journey into transcendence. Spoilers! It doesn't work. But unknown to Castor and his new unexpected ally on the arts of naval intelligence, if you will, operative Veda Lopez and her young team of Spartan 3s, who have been infiltrating the Keepers to lay the groundwork for Castor's assassination. But with Oni's field operations now splintered and cut off by the Guardian radically escalated in scope, there's simply no choice or fallback plan. Either the ferrets somehow stop the Keepers or the galaxy faces an extinction level event. So the timeline is the 12th to the 24th of October. It's roughly, almost exactly I'd say about two weeks of October 2559. So this is pre-Halo Infinite. The location is Ark. The entire book takes place on the Ark, which is pretty cool. Especially because I think I mentioned in a previous podcast, I had kind of forgotten the setting of this a little bit uh, and to see where the book kind of takes place immediately thrusts you into that story and it's it's nicely tailored with the end of Shadows of Reach, which is pretty cool. So I kind of liked how they tie in and this kind of group splinters off and splinters into this book and the story kind of continues. Then there's a whole bunch of characters we'll get to, but I guess there's nobody really maybe surprising and trepid eye crops up Cutter and Red Team. I thought we'd get a lot more of them. I- I'm happy they-, they came in the end, but there isn't really a whole lot of Spirit of Fire. Ash, Mark, Olivia obviously are there. The, f- the ferrets, Veda. Arrakis is a new character. He's a bodyguard for Das Bosfod, who is a new prelay character, like I just mentioned. So uh, Akras is a Jirlhani. Uh, you have Caster, Frizzos, and Krellis. These are like the main kind of keeper Jirlhani who are mentioned. There's a few others. There's then the Banished, which are interestingly only Pavium and Vordis, which I wasn't expecting, to be honest. This is a, a group called the Long Shields. They're like a clan, a part of the Banished. And there's a new character called Sazalan, who is another Jolhani. Islan Gagadai, Gagadai, is that what we said his name was? The Blademaster. He is dope as fuck. 
I love him. And Let Fleur is another kind of lead character who shows up in the middle of this, or in the beginning, to kind of boss around the banished kind of groups. And then there is Commander Barry, who is dope. I really like her. She is the commander of the Reconnaissance Pelican that comes into play for a good portion of the book. And a final mention that I wanted to call out was the only Kikar character, Cavalo, who is hilarious, where... Uh, we'll talk about it later, because one of the funny moments is pretty kind of cool that I actually kind of laughed a little bit reading about this stupid kick air uh, and what happens to him. Guys, the story of the book. It's pretty much... I thought about it today, just kind of clicked in my brain. Very familiar territory. It's pretty much Halo 3 told very quickly. Yeah. Where you have covenant forces like actual covenant forces which i thought was an interesting reveal i don't know if we knew that did we that there was actual covenant not banished like covenant remain you remember i think it was the short story for shadows of reach that's when they revealed it because remember they went into the dreadnought to get the uh slip space crystal that's the walmart broke wasn't it it's the one at the end of that um i think it's available now online so you can go and read it but yeah, that was when they they revealed that yes, there are Covenant survivors on the Dreadnought that have been there since the battle in Halo 3. And they have no idea what happened. <laughs> yeah, they just, like, I like the detail they go into in this book about them, where they, they basically celebrated that the great journey was going to happen. And then the one thing, actually, I, I'll bring it up in a wee second, but there's like one flaw with the lore here, but... They were all sitting on the Dreadnought being like, yay, the Great Journey's going to start. And they're like, oh, fuck, the Great Journey hasn't started. And they're like, oh, the Ark is really fucked. And then they realize, actually, the Ark's repairing. They thought the firing of Installation 08 was the Great Journey beginning. And then they were like, wait a second. It took them a while, though. Yeah, like, are we on the Great Journey? Is this it right now? The one thing, the one query or thing I have about it is that they survived the firing of the Halo on board the Dreadnought when I didn't think shields were enough to protect you from a Halo. But apparently they are, which is then like, why would some of the Flood in the Flood Forerunner War have been killed by the Halo when they were on Forerunner ships? I don't know if that's just me thinking too hard about it, but it seemed like a minor like glitch in the logic. Yeah, I don't know how they'll do that but i guess that halo ring that was fired on the arc maybe wasn't well it wasn't finished? it wasn't finished so maybe it wasn't a full blast or maybe it's because all the rings the rings fire at once and then they have enough oomph to do their thing i don't know maybe it's the overlap effect yeah that that kind of helps eradicate everything but like yeah I, I didn't even think of that at all but like yeah slightly convenient that it only wipes out the flood but then not the Flood on High Charity, because they're sealed in with other, sh- other shields, because we know that from the Halo Wars 2 DLC. So, like, I don't know. It's, yeah, faulty device, Aaron. Just w- when, I'm, when I'm here to pick holes in plot, I like to pick away. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was cool, um, real for me, because obviously I had me sacrifice. So we had, like, a third faction, and it was... I don't know, I really... I liked the fact that it's Banished versus Covenant versus old UNSC from the Spirit of Fire and that like whatever happened with Caster got or Caster sorry Atrox got these crystals from somewhere they got the crystals from the Dreadnought from the Dreadnought sorry so they raided the Dreadnought that short story is three banished teams go and do a raid on the Dreadnought and they get like most of the way into the Dreadnought before the Covenant properly attack and then only like three of them make it back off alive Oh, interesting. That's cool. And then that sets up this... Okay, I really should have read that. My God. Uh, that's my own fault. That's pretty cool. So essentially, like, Aatrox fucks off back to Reach. And then you have the swap where Caster takes his lick, Lich. And then fucks off with the Keepers into the portal. And then, like, he comes through the portal and materializes with a longsword or something. Like a broadsword. And then, like, the pilot is just dead on impact inside the cargo bay, which is nuts as they come out of the portal this thing kind of merges with with each other then all kind of hell breaks loose but um i have to say i loved all of the stuff with the keepers like i loved the dynamics of the characters it got a little bit shitty once intrepid eye was released because like the forerunner and sellers are just like they're op as fuck so like 
you didn't believe for a second that like in Triple I didn't know that the favorites were there. So like the reveal was always always coming. But I did love I loved Caster. I loved Gagli Guy. I loved their relationship. Did like their relationship with, with Veda. I loved. There was a moment where it was like, oh shit, are, are we about to become friends? It's like it's Veda and the Blade Master about to hook up and like prevent Caster because he's obviously not a believer. Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. And obviously the Farrah talk, we kind of haven't said it yet. And the big ugly thing is Mark is dead. Oh shit, Mark dead real good. Spoilers! The story very quickly kind of moves with the Farrah team on the arc, not realizing, holy shit, there's UNSC here. Who the hell are these people? Obviously realizing their armor is old, their gear is old. Oh, that's very interesting. And then trying to maintain contact. How they do that is pretty dope. But like laser sighting this pelican and like making kind of communications there i thought that was pretty cool um so they're quietly the fairy team trying to work against the keepers in getting off the arc so the caster gets to the arc immediately hooks up with the covenant that's there and uh, by coincidence and realizes that the, he kind of helps tricks the banished the banished don't really know why they're there they think it's atrox because it's atrox's ship he stole and came back with they use the humans to they trick the UNSC to like letting them crash land essentially over their kind of forces. So that was kind of hilarious. So Veda kind of jumps in there to kind of like talk as a human and they're like, why is a human talking to the ship? Lots of kind of stuff going on. So essentially once the keepers crash, most of them are like dead. They hook up with the Covenant and like leg it. And they're like, okay, we are getting out of here now that we have a human. Um, they kind of join forces. The prelay is set up very quickly to be like the ultimate dickhead. Yeah, he well, well they, they introduce him, he's like, he was Truth's bodyguard, and you're like, oh, I know exactly what this guy's all about. Yeah, and also very, very interesting in what his actual motivations are, especially makes sense now that there's more Covenant, and he's talking about reaching out to the San Sayum fleet, so like, that's a little nugget that's been like a little loose string that's been out there in the Halo universe of like, where did all the profits go? I like the idea that they have a fleet, it's out there somewhere, they're hiding. The thing this set up specifically is they're in a shield world. This is the thing I like. The Prophets kept, uh, well, the San Jaume kept a secret shield world, and that was their fallback position because they set this up a long time ago that I think it's been asked a couple of times in the Halo lore, where did the Prophets go and where did all their engineers go when they disappeared? And you're like oh yeah, there's got to be prophets out there with engineers. And then you're like, it makes perfect sense that they're sealed away in the shield world, potentially building more prelates and getting ready to come back out into the universe. Well, they also, they want to activate the Halo Array so that they can be like, ah, it's all ours, pretty much. That's what I like. I like that it's not a religious thing now. He's just using Caster and the remaining Covenant as like believers to pretty much set off the halo array so that like it wipes out everybody the people on the arc will be fine but the halo array will wipe out, wipe out everyone else and the sans Sayum come out into a universe that they now own i think that's awesome that's a great way more interesting idea than let's just like this for the great journey which was interesting back in the day but like it's been revealed as being false so many times in so many forces throughout the halo lore that like you're as a reader shouting a caster going like god damn it man god damn it you're cool start being cool figure shit out and obviously that's hard do you know what i mean when you're embedded as religion like that and they make note of it a couple of places about like the jalhane were like heavily influenced at a very particular time in their history which helped them assimilate so strongly but it's pretty cool. I liked the Covenant joining up with the, with, uh, with Caster that there's a third faction on the arc. That was pretty cool. The Ferret team kind of like leg it. They, like, they, they're going towards the cartographer to find the map, to find a citadel. I can't remember how Dashwood knows that there is a citadel. He knows that there's a cartographer, but the Covenant have been stuck on the arc without a human, so they've been unable to pretty much do anything regarding the arc. So they're pretty much stranded. They can't use any of the Forerunner technology. They obviously can't leave. And there's a bunch of humans and banished around fighting, so they can't really stand up to them. So the big thing is just they didn't have a human. And that's kind of a huge theme throughout this entire book is that we just need a human to do our shit. He basically does say that, yeah, we've known where the cartographer is for a while, but it's surrounded by sentinels and we can't get there. Then he's like, yeah, we we know there's a new control, or there's a new, yeah, there's a new Halo 
firing station somewhere it's like because it had to exist to launch the halo that left the ark a couple of months ago clever yeah that's it yeah anders found it and anders launched the halo so this is how they know that it's rebuilt in some form but again because they don't have a human they can't get there so by the way i saw this mentioned in i think it was a facebook series a comments but i am now only referring to them as fire team ferret <laughs> fire team ferret Ooh. i like it and that's going to be the continuation but this is basically the plan now is we have fire team ferret and we're going to use them to activate all of the forerunner stuff and get to the halo controls and kill everyone perfect what a great plan it is pretty good. I loved this was there was a moment here, right? They're being so the Covenant and Keepers are on the run. The banished are chasing them. Essentially. Pavium and Vordis. This book does such a long way to redeeming them as being like interesting characters. Yeah, but they don't do anything. No, but they're they are described as tactical geniuses. You have Vordis figuring out the messages he reads, do you know what I mean? Like he he, he cops on to what they're doing. They have all these subtle little in-game plans to kind of like get themselves uh, higher esteem within for Aatrox and that's simply their thing again trying to redeem themselves uh, from Halo Wars 2 DLC which is pretty funny I, d- I do think that they're, they're more they're not as boring as they were in that do you know what I mean we were shitting on them a lot especially the dumb brother yeah but he he, he kind of comes away as, as being a, a lot more interesting character and I, I think that's deliberate uh, obviously trying to redeem that character as well so I thought that was cool I thought they were interesting so they're on the chase they're on the hunt trying to take out the keepers and the Covenant kind of linking up. There's an element there too that I, that I think was pretty cool. Like when the ships land, they're like, okay, we've got to get on goats and we've got to leg it on these goats. Where the fair team decide, oh shit, man, we got to slow these people down. So they have a plan that obviously one that they worked before. And Olivia like pushes into a bunch of elites and like trips them up. And then, is it Mark or Ash? Someone, one of them turns around and shoots someone in a drop pod bay. And then turns to the kid gear and go, Hey, kid gear, why the hell did you do that, you crazy son of a bitch? And everyone goes, Oh my god, the crazy kid gear. And they, they just killed the kid gear, which <laughs> I thought was hilarious. I think it was Mark or so Ash or something just puts the gun in his fist and was just like, Ha ha ha, genius plan in that enabled. I thought that was really funny. Yeah, that poor kid gear just standing there, minding his own business, and then next minute he gets a belly full of brute spikes and is like, Oh, poor guy, you weren't doing anything wrong. Well, apart from being a member of the Keepers, like, but the other thing from shortly after that scene that I thought was really cool was how they get the attention of the UNSC. Yes. Yeah, that was really cool. Veda has most people bugged and she has Caster's communication disc bugs, so she gets to hear the pilots say that there are banished flying over on one area and there's a human reconnaissance pelican hiding in the shadows of the mountains over to their, the other side. And then she's like, right, we need to communicate with them. And the team are on top of the hill talking about it. And they're like, well, we'd probably need to launch a missile from this distance to get their attention. And then Mark's like, I could paint them with the targeting laser on my rifle. But they're like, what is it, 60 kilometers away from the Pelican? Yeah, I read this uh, like at the time it was happening going, oh yeah, that's cool. That's totally doable. And then like when they describe it later of how much of a badass action that was, that this person's clearly augmented to be able to do that. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. That's what I like about it is the crew immediately put two and two together because they, they later meet up with the Pelican crew and they're like, so I think Veda says like, you know, my, my Spartans back there and the pilot's like, how the hell did you not mention they're Spartans? And the other guy goes like, they're not big enough to be Spartans. And then the other guy pipes up and goes, they tagged us with a laser mounted sight from 60 kilometers away they must be spartans and that's how they believe them so i I like that that's like their thing is like no there's no ordinary human could have marked a moving target from that distance with a rifle so they know that they're they are spartans even if they don't have armor it's really cool also I love that once again, like, it, I thought after the last book when the guys were running low on smoothers and they talked about, uh, Veda talked about installing implants in their brains to, like, have longer term smoother. I figured that wouldn't be an issue again this novel, but we were immediately back to we have 24 hours worth of smoothers left and then everyone's going to go gaga. That's another thing I was waiting till the end of the book to kind of mention. In fact, I was a little bit disappointed that, like, 
the ferret's story, like their undercover op, is like immediately blown more or less, let's say a third of the way through this book, that we don't get to see that operation happen. We're at the very end of it, essentially, where they're being revealed and they have to up their game so they kind of show their hands so they're no longer undercover. Well, it honestly, like, from describing it, it honestly sounds like most of their operation was really fucking boring because they started this operation, Cortana takes over the galaxy, and then they're like, well, I guess we just have to play along, and they, they've just been playing along ever since. Right, but they also mentioned somewhere in the book that they estimate that their casualty is something like, what, 15,000 keepers they've managed to kill over two years? That might be a good short novel or something. Yeah, I'd love to see, like, all the kind of, you can imagine, crazy wacky moments that they're, like, killing keepers all over the shop. Is the majority of those deaths, though, down to the destruction of the keeper base from the other novel? Yeah, probably. Pro- you're probably right. Probably just, probably mass scale things that they managed to engineer. Yeah, like, I put most of it down probably to that, and then the others are, like, I'd imagine pirate teams and stuff being taken out, but... So they pretty much, they get to into Kratak for not really exciting here. They reveal that there is one very close to them that they can get there. Well, they talk about Intrepid Eye reveals herself before this. Yeah, sorry, Intrepid Eye reveals herself pretty much here. I love her motivations as well. Yeah, that came out of the blue for me. Did we know that before? And like, she has just decided now that uh, humans are to take the mantle of responsibility, but Cortana's fucked that up. So the only way to defeat the Krana is to attack the Domain, and the only way to do that is to light the rings. So she's like, I'll bring humanity back afterwards. Well, I think we kind of knew that Intrepid Eye didn't like the current course of humanity, because when she was on Gao, she saw the infighting between the Insurrectionists and the UNSC. So she saw that humanity wasn't united, so her plan was, at least in this novel, is... Well, her plan was to try to start, like grooming humanity from the shadows which is why she started doing weird shit like uh, what she did in Retribution and setting up the keepers and stuff like that so she was grooming humanity and then Cortana happened Cortana also defiled the domain so she's like well I can get rid of humanity I can rebuild them and the domain will be the d- domain will be damaged so Cortana can't be in there so I, c- I can defeat her But she also, like, she had this plan to wipe out humanity before, because that was her point with the virus, was she was going to release the virus in the galaxy and then only give the humans she wanted to save the cure, and that was really the gist of it was. She was going to, like, selectively cleanse the human population and only keep the ones that she wanted. What a character. (laughs) Yeah, I like the part where she mentioned she, she squared off with Cortana and lost. That, that's something I would have liked to have seen. You know, she's basically like, I'm going to take this bitch out. And then she's like, oh, fuck, she's got more resources than I have now. And then she had to come up with this plan B, which was like, yeah, we're just going to destroy the domain again because fuck her. I love AIs, but I think that the concept of them fighting is just so foreign to us. I don't know how we you would write that into a story. I guess we've seen it a little bit here and there, but a big on a big scale like that other than like oh I found a firewall and then I got through it and then I found another firewall and I got through it it's true that's why I like the idea of them fighting by proxies which is kind of interesting you know Cortana having her own physical forces and maybe Intrepid Eye having her own but anyway she reveals so that's interesting so she's kind of like making she's the oracle right so the covenant forces and the keepers are like holy shit we have an oracle this is great she's installed herself and like all of their gear random bits and pieces everywhere to keep herself alive keep herself taken along so they get the cartographer they get in there's a bit of chit chat they reveal oh there's a citadel over here that's where you need to go brilliant let's go there they then realize intrepid eye and the blade master are pretty much come forward and said to caster the the ferrets are bastards we gotta get you know what i mean they're part of it we need to kill them essentially so then they set up a plan to essentially to um trick them It's a pretty cool plan, to be honest. So they trick Veda into giving her the location and the coordinates of where they're going to bury, dig up the ice, essentially, and get into the Citadel. They reveal that information to the Banished, so the Banished go there as well, and the humans essentially wipe them out because Veda hooks up with... Sorry, Veda, they... they, Oh, sorry. They drop... They get dropped off. There's a kind of tense conversation where Veda... And I kind of liked that, like... They weren't ambushed. That the ferrets immediately knew. Yeah, we're blown. When they realized Intrepid Eye was there, they like they started avoiding cameras and stuff. And then Intrepid Eye picked it up, saying that like they know I'm here. 
So that all reveal was kind of really cool. I'm glad that it happened. The way it happened was kind of was kind of cool as well. It wasn't kind of dragged out. So they very quickly kind of established. Okay, when once we got dropped off, we know we've been made, we've been made. So like they kind of do quick kind of actions and kind of like disappear. So like the Covenant forces and keepers can't find them. Um, they do kind of a cool attempt at like taking them out, which is pretty dope. They realize very quickly there's only two humans left with the keepers, and they're the key. Um, so they pretty much try to kill them and successfully do one of them, I believe, here at this kind of moment. So they kind of they ambush the keepers. There's some good fight. I think is it here that like the prelate just spears one of them. I think he gets one of them here, doesn't he? Does he get Mark here? No, I think it's during the he gets injured during the battle of um in front of the citadel when they're trying to get in. You're right. That's when they start getting injured. <laughs> they start getting picked off. It starts dropping. Yeah, yeah. So this is pretty cool. So they are here. They're fighting. They kind of do some damage. They hurt Caster pretty badly. They kill a bunch of dudes, and then they kind of have to bug out. Then I'm pretty sure it's here they get picked up by the UNSC. So the Pelican comes in, essentially picks them up. Uh, cool kind of conversation, and you get the kind of interesting dynamics between a Oni team that's up to date in the current world, and then you have the Spirit of Fire forces who haven't a clue what's going on. So that was kind of really interesting seeing these teams come together. I really liked this pelican, this crazy ass massive pelican that has a shower and multiple rooms and like <laughs> this is just like a long range censored pelican. People just live here while they're like scouting and looking at things and keeping an eye on stuff. I mean, sounds pretty cool. No, it was a pelican. It wasn't a condor, was it? That's what I thought. It's definitely a pelican the way it's described. Yeah, it's not a condor. Because I had that when they were talking about like the space and I was like this seems like it would be more suited to being condor-sized. But I suppose then, like, there is enough room in the back of a pelican to hold a fair amount of stuff. So if all you need is bunk beds and a wash space and desk space and stuff, it's probably doable. So I kind of really liked that. I thought that was interesting. This is where Commander Barr comes in. She's he's the leader of this pelican. So there's a couple of other kind of characters. There's a full team about four or five people, I think, on this pelican um this is really cool the debrief kind of that happens here is really cool veda kind of comes clean and tells him everything these are spartans do you know what i mean this a lot has happened now since the that you've missed out on this was all really interesting i kind of really like that this character and kind of what they do is pretty cool too so they pretty much just start putting together a kind of a plan and they're chasing the forces together they kind of have to try and stay away so veda has a location she thinks it's real and it isn't essentially pavium and vortis send cop on that that information they got was way too easily so they instead send one of their rivals in their clans there with all his dudes <laughs> which is so funny bombard it with a bunch of vultures and wipe out <laughs> the, a whole bunch of banished forces so i thought that was all really kind of funny and i kind of really liked it. i thought it was cool you had vultures coming in and just wiping out this floating island and killing all these dudes then you have Veda figuring that out of like, okay, they just bombed a bunch of dudes. Who was it though? Oh crap, it wasn't the Covenant. I didn't think there'd be Seraphs. I thought there would be Phantoms and stuff like that. And it wasn't, so that's kind of interesting. And how did they go down? They figure out they look a bit of armor. A crazy monster comes out and eats one of the pilots. That was kind of mental and out of nowhere. It just pretty much sells you to the point that like everyone hates her. It ate her and then they left and then that was the end of it. And the monster was never spoken of again. I love their, like, they've gone a couple of times now in the arc and pointed out about all the life forms on it because earlier in the book, they, they battled basically what sounds like sentient, tiny, crawly seaweeds because they're all these little eyes on stalks that, like, attack in groups and, like, actually at one point... Forgot about the creature attacks. Yeah, they outmaneuver the ferrets because they're, like, chasing them up the hill and then the ferrets are like... These motherfuckers are flanking us. They've played us this entire time. And they're like, oh, we are fucked. Thankfully, they they survive that particular encounter. But they, every time you hear about creatures on the Ark, you're like, this is the most terrifying version of Jurassic Park in existence. Oh, uh, don't tell Tom that. Yeah, it's pretty mental. But, like, it's so bad. Everything on the Ark basically just wants to eat you all the time. We had it really easy in Halo 3, holy shit. Totally. Uh, let's jump ahead a bit now because we're getting a bit long and there's lots kind of happening really fast. So eventually the ferrets realize the spirit dawns too far away. We haven't got four reforces. We have to go back in ourselves. We have to make up our own plan. So Veda essentially gets the Pelican team to drop her off. I can't remember exactly where. Uh, they Did they saw where 
Caster, Busvod, and Gadagai were going correct, and then they like were trailing them. That was it, yeah. And they pretty much got dropped off. The banished figured out, Pavium and Vortis figured out where the Citadel is, and they get there first and reinforce it. Then you have the Covenant trying to break in, and then they go somewhere else. They go to like a communications place to activate the defenses, don't they? They do that, and there's a conversation then. Pretty much all the forces end up fighting all, all over this area, uh, over the Citadel, and this is where shit goes, gets crazy. There's like a missile barrage, I can't remember where exactly, but the UNSC bomb the shit out of the Citadel and they kill them. Well, they pretty much kill all the Keepers except two dudes, and then all the Covenant except two dudes. And then the, the Ferret team pop up then and ambush Caster. Somewhere along the way, I forget where, but the last remaining human of the Keepers gets wiped out. So therefore that was Veda's plan was to wipe out the last human, therefore them themselves being the only humans left and then legging it out so that the Covenant have to like capture one of them essentially and that's their only choice if they want to activate Halo. So then there's a bunch of people start dying left and right here now, uh, Mark gets speared by the Predates uh, Glaive and- You gotta, um, this is where they come out with the plan to kill Intrepid Eye, which is a dope plan, it's so good. It's pretty damn good, so Intrepid Eye is kind of like- they realize we have to kill Intrepid Eye. We can't just leave them leave them here. It's too much of a resource to leave in the hands of the Covenant. So they kind of fight their way through. Veda decides, okay, I have to get captured. Stick a bug in my jaw. There's a dope fight here between some brutes, Caster, and Ferdos and, and Krellis, I think one of the other kind of guys. A lot of Spartan trees doing Spartan tree stuff, get fucked up, but still keep going because they're crazy sons of bitches. And they're off their smoothers now. They're going nuts. It's pretty interesting. And Veda's freaking out. She lets herself get captured as part of the plan. The Blade Master kind of beats her up a little bit and then Caster and him leg it off and go with the Prelate and the last remaining Jirahani into the Citadel. Intrepid Eye kind of like lies her way and tricks her way inside with the Ancilla that's kind of working there. And that's kind of an interesting conversation there, kind of back and forth. The little maneuver Veda pulls to try and slow down Intrepid Eye, where she tells the monitor of the Citadel that Intrepid has the logic plague. Yes. I like it because she doesn't even really know what the logic plague is. She just read it in a report and shouted it, and it fucking, of course, works. The monitor in charge immediately turns on airplane mode and is like, no, 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 you you, you can't use the Wi-Fi now, Intrepid Eye, very sorry about that. And then she starts like her battle of logic going back and forth and like she's slowly starting to make progress. But like, if I followed it right, isn't the gist of the plan that Intrepid Eye is installed in multiple chips across multiple devices and she needs to reassemble herself and decompress so her plan is to get into the system in the Citadel, and then once she decompresses, the team know that she's trapped there temporarily until she can recompress herself, so they want to mac the Citadel and destroy her. And I'm like, that's a pretty good plan. She's a huge Ancilla. She's huge. She can't fit into just one data chip. She has to spread herself so thin, which is why she was spread out amongst all of the Keeper technology. And which is why when the Pelican makes its, like, bombing run and kills a bunch of the Keepers, she loses a bunch of shit and she's really pissed off. Of course she wants to be there when the Halos fire, so she wants to be in the system. And Veda recognizes that, so she's gonna, she's gonna somehow, you know, get herself together, get into the system so that she can, you know, I guess stretch her legs, you know, relax a little bit. She's been in all these, like, little devices. And then, of course, she wants to be there and watch, pretty much watch and curate the firing of the Halos. So they know she's going to be in there. I meant to ask this, but I, I needed to wait till we were all finished reading the book because it's probably a question we'll have to figure out later. But do I remember from somewhere in the Halo Wars lore that the Mac gun on the Spirit of Fire was out of commission for some reason? Is, it, is that something I imagine? Because... Isn't there a lore reason why you don't have Mac Blasts in Halo Wars 2? You do have Mac Blasts in Halo Wars 2. Do you? Yeah, it's one of the leader powers, isn't it? I thought it was called down debris from orbit. Is that not the Mac, the power? No, no. Maybe I imagined that. The debris from orbit thing? I don't know what that is. That could be a different faction. Well, maybe I'm thinking of, is it Jerome? He can call down the debris from the cruiser that they crippled. 
like you literally drop pieces of cruiser debris on people. That's his like bombardment that leader must power. Be a multiplayer or blitz thing, is it? It's in one of them. I I thought I remembered that their gun was out of commission, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, you also got to remember it's been a couple months since Halo Wars 2, so they could have repaired the Mac gun. I'm sure that was one of their like top priorities. Isn't that why they can't shoot the cruiser and they have to come up with the plan for Jerome and Isabel to go and board it because they can't slug it out with Max? That's not necessarily... They couldn't do it with Max, but they couldn't do it with just one. The time between shots, the shield would recharge. Like, it wouldn't, it's not strong enough. That's why you have to, like, layer the shots, right? Yeah, I, th- I think a cruiser of that size, one Mac cannon can't kill it. That... Could probably be it. Maybe I'm just getting a bit too into the weeds. And it's one of the big. It's not a small cruiser. It was one of the really, really big ones, if I remember correctly. Super carrier. Yeah. I don't. I don't think a one ship's mac gun can even like touch a super carrier. And I think that was the issue. That could be fair enough. That might just be me then. But like, it's a good plan. I like it. It's a great plan. I love it. I also like that. Like, it backfires big time in Intrepid Eye. That like. Because of her logic and having to talk out loud because of what Beta did, she has to pretty much announce the fact that the Halo ring is not a holy thing. It is just her wiping out being sort of flood, and that breaks Caster's brain, which is a huge <laughs> moment in the book, finally, where like the Oracle turns around and goes, oh, don't worry, trust me, I'm, I'm cool. Uh, and Caster's like, oh, fuck this. Yeah. So like he has a mental breakdown, uh, which is important, obviously. So... Intrepid Eye gets in, and when she gets in, Veda pretty much says, do it, guys, blow him up. I love that moment, because Intrepid Eye looks back and sees Veda smirking, and then she's like, what? Veda's like, boom. Ah, it's so good. Max shots, baby. And then they use the EMP shots from the game, which I thought was really cool. I like that they they brought that into effect. So the EMP Mac blasts are pretty much slowly whittling down the shield this crazy stuff going on and Shepard is trying to get in and take over the system the Spartan trees are kind of like trying to fight back Mark is in bits he fights a he kind of holds the ground because like he can't run very much because he's fucked up to bits so he ends up fighting the sentinels in the background while Ash and Olivia run forward kill the last remaining kind of keepers. Well, no, then the Banished show up, and then they're like, hey, right before they walk in, the Banished show up, and then there's a fight, and then there's only a couple people left. Well, no, they kill Cre- They get Krellis pretty much dead, and then Krellis lets them know- Krellis stays alive long enough so that when the ferrets enter, he shoots off his gun, and then the ferrets go up there, and they're they're already ready for them. And that actually was a cool moment where Veda realizes we can get reinforcements from the Spirit of Fire, but we can use the Banished to our advantage by telling the Banished where they're going, where the Covenant are going. So that's how the Banished get to the Citadel first, which I thought was a cool moment. And then even the guys realize it, but don't care, because they're like, we're going to have to do it anyway. So that was kind of dope. Then we got Krellis, who was the son of Orson, who died pretty much the same way by stepping in front of a bunch of shots meant for Caster. So I thought that was kind of like nice. Uh, So he had his ending. Then Caster's kind of like broken up and Blade Master's all freaking out and then everybody just starts fighting each other. They're all fighting Spartan Trees, they're all fighting the Prelate, they kick his ass. Pam and Mavordum get also their asses kicked by Caster and the Prelate and end up getting thrown over the sides of the kind of cliff. Oh my god, it was such like a Star Wars moment when they pushed the Prelate off. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and then the Prelate gets kind of shot slash pushed off by the Spartans and the Veda is tied up to the Blade Master and eventually kind of like wills her way out of there. The Blade Master ends up fighting against the Prelate and again with, with Caster on his side because he's finally now turned against the Covenant. It's funny where like everybody falls down this cliff, everybody's fine. Nobody dies. They're all this is a nice little slippy slide out to safety. Even though they see Bosfad like hitting the struts on the way down, it's so OP. It's crazy funny i was thinking when they talk about him falling down and hitting off the stuff all i could picture was the phantom menace yeah darth maul right (laughs) yeah if darth maul had have had that armor he would have survived better too without maybe being cut in half no it is very very op because he gets fucked up a couple of times and then even at the end of it, he's like, oh, if I give my armor a little time to repair, I can summon in reinforcements and everything else. And you're like, 
that that's like next level super armor. He's got nanobots. He's got nanobots. Don't you dare nanobot me. <laughs> I li- he pretty much has. Uh, I like the showdown. So like the remaining ferrets are of a showdown with Caster and the Blade Master, and they pretty much go their separate ways because they're like we can just all kill each other or we can just leg it and get the fuck out of here before the last Mac blast comes down. They're like yeah fuck it let's do it. So Caster eventually leaves with the Blade Master and Ash and Olivia take Vela and leg it out the other end. And they can't find Mark. They're kind of all crap. But anyway, we gotta leg it. The last blast comes down and that's kind of it black out they all fall down the cliff this is where i thought the book ended but i realized there's too much left in this book what i was reading i was like oh crap what else is going to happen next well i figured it'd be like the wrap-up shit is what i was thinking yeah ra- yeah that, that's true but i was like all these people fell down a hole and are probably fine so like where are they coming from so essentially yeah the banished forces the only remaining two are Pabin and Vortis, who are kind of they just watch everything from a distance they see the prelate coming out he's carrying a big rock in his hand He's totally fine. They say in the way he carries his like his rock shape, I was like, oh, is that like an oracle? Does he have to monitor his intrepid eye in a device that he has? That's what I was thinking straight away. Ash is trying to keep Veda alive. He is on floating piece of ice. They're falling down this cliff. This crater is gone. The whole mountain is gone. They macked it to fuck. Mark sees the prelate running towards Veda and Ash, who are on the ground. And he has a particle beam taken off his dead aggressor that he managed to beat. And he just shoots the prelate a bunch of times. Shoots his rock so it blows up. Um, so it is just a rock he was just trying to throw at Veda. And essentially the prelate just runs up and snaps Mark's neck and that's it. That was so shocking too. It was just so easy for him to do it. Yeah, it was incredibly hardcore. Prelates are OP. Prelates, oh, and then he just decides that okay, the pelican comes in essentially, and red team show up. Spartans are dropping down, they're picking stuff out of water, and they're picking up dudes. They pick up Olivia, and essentially, that's why the prelate just says, Nope, I'm not doing this. My armor got to be holding it, it burned through to my flesh. But guess what? That's fine because in 10 days' time, my uber suit will be perfect once more, and I can just talk to everybody and essentially call in. So he just nopes out, he leaves, uh, the banished forces leave. Caster and Giglioi eventually have their end discussion of what are we going to do. He says we're just going to kill our enemies, kill them all. And it's interesting, like, who is his enemy now? Is it the San Shihum? Is it Veda? Is it the Covenant? But because the interesting thing is Bosfad was like, alright, well the Halos aren't going to work, so we're going to have to go to plan B with the San Shihum and just come out guns blazing. So now the San Shihum are probably going to go for a galactic wide takeover of the of everything and that's going to be really cool to watch. I'm so excited for that, especially if they've been like manufacturing prelates and they're just going to pump them out. This is the thing I was thinking. Do you remember back in Glasslands like the Kilo 5 trilogy, they talk about how in a shield world you can control the speed of time. So I love the idea that like the San Shiom have been locked away for a couple of years, but maybe it's been like decades for them locked away in this shield where like they could have hundreds of prelates, they could have thousands, like they could have a whole civilization. I mean, they could have just found a cache of Forerunner shit too and just been using that. Their numbers are still going to be limited though. I think they're, they might, because like they can't make that many prelates because they can't reproduce that well. What if they have one of those green engineers? Yeah, but like, if they have those and they can turn the t- they can turn speed up, you know, you can do all of that. Like, even if you can only make a few, you can only make a few Sandstone babies at a time. You could maybe breed for hundreds of years if you crank the speed up fast enough. I don't know if Halo will go that crazy, but that would be nuts. I would love the idea of it because it just gives you like an unlimited supply of prelates to make like a really cool new faction. I'm down with that. The San Shayun being their own faction, making their own stuff again, would be very interesting, especially if they're not supported by, like, the Covenant. I like that. Well, obviously, they still have some of the allied races by the looks of it. That is really cool. Especially when they're armed with, like, the engineers against the Ancillas and stuff. I thought that that's pretty cool. Halo, yeah, a new faction would be nice. And they're introducing the Banished anyway in a big way, so we're about to get a lot of that stuff. There's a little bit of back and forth where Pavian and Vortis are like, oh, we're going to make everybody believe this is all part of our plan, aren't we clever bastards? And that's like, their whole clan is dead, the two of them. <laughs> well, they didn't like them anyway, so... The best look to those boys. There is uh, 
a great and it was satisfying the kind of wrap up of the ferret team of the debrief the Spartan 3's meeting Spartan 2's for the first time thought that was really interesting that was cool like I think Alice was like how are you people alive what the hell is going on just like <laughs> ashes falling apart biofoam is everywhere it's kind of horrible they do pick up Mark's body and like Ash is like he's still alive because he's a 3 right so 3's can't be dead and Alice is like his neck is broken his intestines are outside his body he has bled to death this guy is dead and Ash is like maybe <laughs> it's like okay dude. I don't know you're not God <laughs> Yeah, and and, it, and there was a, a moment there where I was thinking, oh, maybe he can survive a neck break. You just break it. Oh, I, I don't know. I was like, what, what kind of craziness are they going to bring in here? But yeah, they 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 make it a point that like he died three times. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like he's three times dead over. It's cool. It's a good wrap up. The kind of funeral scene is kind of good. I like that they introduce introduce Cutter. Dude, he's like video game dad. He's so nice. He's really nice. He's really cool. He knows all about kind of the trees, and he obviously got a good proper debrief. The funeral was kind of cool. I, li- I liked it. I liked the group of, of people that they put together in the story and where the ferrets end up of just being like, yeah, we're here now. We're part of the Spirit of Fire's forces. That's pretty damn cool. But like a ferret team down with a ferret kind of sucks. That's kind of the harshness of it. Like there's only two of them left now. It was a little sad. I do like the idea that we could get a Halo Wars 3 someday and uh, Veda could just be a faction leader. I would love that. Her special ability is just like ferret takedown. Uh, there's there's so much they can do with their characters now. I'm so excited. Definitely, and they've obviously set up the arc storyline as being somewhere very unique and very interesting, which I really like. You have a very hostile arc, very hostile arc world. You have Banish forces, Covenant forces, UNSC forces. It's very interesting. I, I like the setup of what they've done there and where the kind of story ends. The only th- kind of thing, or say, story overall, have you guys got any kind of interesting parts that I haven't kind of mentioned? I talked a lot there. Is there anything I missed you guys want to call out? So when they introduced Pad, Fium, and Vortis, I'm like, oh shit, they're going to end up fighting alongside Veda because the enemy of my enemy kind of shit. I was hoping for like a flood moment of Halo 3 where it's like, we're friends for now. But I feel like the Padvium and Vortis were so underutilized. They were in like maybe three, four chapters and then they just served their purpose and just kind of bounced. Very much so. Like I felt like you could also, you could have told almost the same story without them being there. Like did you need a banished faction there at all? Because like it could have just been Veda and UNSC with her limited resources chasing down the Keepers and the Covenant like that. That would have been interesting I think. Um, but anyway, yeah, you're, you're true. There's, there's not much to them really. They're there. They survived. I was kind of weird, like, all the major enemies survived, like, all of them. Like, only Mark died, and that gives a bit of consequence to it, but I think it is kind of interesting that, like, they've built up all these really good enemies now, and they're just in the universe, and we don't even know who they're enemies of yet, which is kind of interesting. I feel like the only person, the only two that you don't know what their motivations are is, um, Caster and Gadagai. You don't really know what they're what they're going to do next, but you kind of know what the Banished are going to do next, and you know what Busfod is probably going to do next. The Banished motivations are still a little bit of a mystery of like, what are these die? What, what's their end goal? I mean, Atriox just noped the hell out of the Ark, so like, why is he still there? Yeah, I think at this point they're just holding the Ark. I feel like the end goal seems to be get control of a Halo. I don't know why, but this is twice now because we know they tried to get the Halo in Halo Wars 2. I assume that's why they're on the Ark, and it also appears then that they've tried to get Zeta Halo in Infinite, and have partially succeeded. So it seems like whatever Atriox's plan is involves having control of a Halo. So that seems to be like, it makes sense then that the end goal would be keep control of the Ark, because that's where replacement Halos come from. But he's no longer interested in it, and he wants to go back to the galaxy to acquire halos through other means it's interesting Uh, maybe we'll learn more in halo infinite about exactly what atriox wants to do because he's been around for a while and we're still just kind of like other than just general conquest we have no idea what he's up to it's either that or atriox is actually trying to keep control of the halos to keep them away from someone else and we just don't know about it yet like that's the only other thing i can assume is that He's doing this for intelligent reasons, and he's not, like, trying to kill all the people. 
he's maybe afraid that someone else like the Harbinger would want control of the Halos. It seemed like they were almost working with the Harbinger by what Eshiram was saying. I wonder then, is it like to keep them away from Cortana? What did you guys think about the fact that like the main kind of big bad of this book was something you knew was never going to happen? They were never going to activate the Halo Rings. Do you know what I mean, that was never a question. So it was just a case of writing out the story. What did, what did you guys think? I feel like that's always the case. Like you knew even in Halo 3, they were never going to activate the Halos. You're like, no, they're going to come through this. And the same in Hunters in the Dark, the Halos were never going to activate. They were going to figure this out. So like, I think I never assume that they're going to actually activate the Halos because that would make life a bit more interesting. Although I kind of was holding out a little bit of hope that that was my theory at one stage for maybe that was why minor spoiler for the pilot trailer way back in the day for Halo Infinite when all those dead symbols are in space I kind of thought you think that was a ring detonation I was thinking like did the Halo partly activate um was it uh, what did he call it guilty spark in Halo 3 calls it like a tactical pulse so I was like maybe like I was waiting for this to be the countdown started they started to pulse and then maybe Vader would hit the shutdown or something and be like oh this happened at exactly the same time as the battle for Zeta Halo and it just fucked everyone up instantly. So that was like, that was the most I was willing to assume. Well, you have to remember that Zeta Halo is also part of the ring array uh, before the Senescent array where they could like, it was like a beam that you could just fucking like hit people with. <laughs> you could like really, really tune it to hit stuff. The differences between them actually would be interesting to see if they if that comes into play at all that's interesting actually i never thought of that i'm thinking that maybe the banished are like the forces think that they can tune halo to wipe out a specific race or specific types of races and not just that's what i'm thinking they're trying to modify it and change because otherwise like having the constant mcguffin being like entire galaxy being wiped out or nothing do you know what i mean of like can't always be the halo threat yeah but like does, does Atriox really want to just kill everyone in the universe? That's why I think my idea that Atriox is doing it to keep it out of someone else's hands, actually, because I still maintain Atriox is going to end up being our ally someday because he's too intelligent a character to be an idiot. And it's going to be like an Arbiter turn of events where he's going to team up with humanity eventually. And I'm like, it makes sense if his goal is to keep the Halos away from someone else. Like, maybe he sees that he looks around the galaxy and he sort of sees that humanity, well, they can't quite be trusted and they're in no fit position to do anything. And he's like, I'm one of the most powerful factions in the universe at the minute, so I will step in and do this myself. I could see that making sort of sense that he's not there to kill everyone in the galaxy. He's there to stop it. And if he gains power in the process... Or maybe whatever he wanted to do, he achieved at the start of Halo Infinite. And the banished forces there are just there to mop up whatever's left. And he's just, he's gone. He's just noped out. He moved on to his next objective. Like what if, whatever they wanted to do, they got. Anyway, we're talking too much about another book. Uh, Aaron, is there anything else you want to say about this book? Or any, any other tidbits? No, overall, I, I was pretty happy with it. I thought it was a pretty good book. It's well paced. There, there aren't really any lulls in it, which I like in a book. Like, if you're going to go with a story, don't faff around too much. Just get straight into it. So I appreciate that. Tolkien. Yeah, about my only complaint is that, once again, the stims were a thing that uh, we needed smoothers again. I was like, maybe I thought we had finally got past that stage and we were just going to be like, okay, we're done with the smoother angle being a thing. I think they just needed it for dramatic if they needed something ticking. I, I hope they do manage to get around. I mean, obviously they've said, okay, they have that throwaway line at, at the end where like the smoothers here are different than the smoothers we get elsewhere because they have different resources and they come from different sources. But I don't know, maybe there's something on the arc that's unique that they could make to not have to need all these smoothers again because I can't, I, I can't imagine that like the spirit of fire it has a better facility for fixing spartan trees than like what they had access to at the end of our last book like before they went on their two-year mission you thought you would take care of the smoother problems other than having to constantly resupply this deeply undercover force with like this really unique drugs you you think you'd fix it before that mission do you know what i mean 
I, I think that's like the only thing I'd like to see sort of like dropped or written out somehow. But other than that, no way to. I had a pretty good time with the story and like it goes places and even though at the end of it they're now stuck on the arc with the spirit of fire like it gets to the stage where the halos can't be fired now for another few years from the arc so it takes that out of the equation so now it's just a battle between the banished the covenant and the unsc there but no i enjoyed it i don't really have any major complaints about this story chris anything else you want to add before we kind of finish up I liked it. I thought it was a good book. I liked the characters. I liked where all the characters left off as well. Um, and I kind of like, it feels like this book is almost like setting up something else. It's it's good. It like finished off kind of like the weird thing we saw in Shadows of Reach, but also it's setting up like the San Shihum, the prelates, whatever Caster is going to do when Trepid Eye is now dead. So it kind of finished the Intrepid Eye saga, but it set up a bunch of other stuff. So I really appreciate that because now we have something to look forward to. All right. Thank you for joining us. Like we mentioned at the top of the show, you can find every episode to all of our shows on our website, halopodcastvault.com. It also features links to our Discord server, Facebook group, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club, and other contact information. Once again, another special shout outs to all of our patrons for supporting this show and making all of this possible. Head to patreon.com slash halopodcastevolved to learn more. And finally, if you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode or previous episodes or anything Halo related, Halo related, please, uh, you can give us a call at 205 Evolved. That's 205 386 5833. And with that, I have been your host, Krista. And until next time, Evolved! Evolved! Evolved!